Namaste, Namaskar, Vanakam, Sastri Kal, and welcome back to Grow with the Jan family. I'm Anjali. And today we're going to be doing a little bit more uh, learning politics about India. So we did uh, Syed Akibadin's um, speech from the UN uh, after they had that closed door session about uh Jammu and Kashmir, and we know, you know, about the Article 370 and 35A. We've been learning a little bit more about that, and so we've been kind of doing a little bit of research, a little bit more information, and my husband found, you know, we were a little bit confused about, you know, why Pakistan still wants part of Kashmir, and where, what's the history behind it, and my husband ran into this article, uh, this video, I should say, with Christine Fair in it, and he was like, she's amazing, she knows so much information, uh, you know, she really is like a truth seeker, and she has lots of um, good research about it, and he felt like even he learned something, he was like, I, this was not taught in our history books, I didn't really know what happened, how it got broken up, and why, and so he was like, she really puts, puts it in perspective, and is very knowledgeable and he wanted us to react to it and share it with you um, if you haven't seen her stuff before uh, she does a lot of there's a few videos on YouTube on her and she also writes books um, and she's amazing so we're gonna react on uh, how crazy Packies keep banging their heads against the wall despite multiple injuries by Christine Fair so it's a six and a half minute video so we're gonna check it out and give you our opinion. One of the first things that Pakistan and India do when, when the two states become independent, when the Brits decolonize South Asia in 1947, in 48, is that they go to war. And they go to war because Pakistan was trying to seize Kashmir. Uh, why did Pakistan want to seize Kashmir? Well, Pakistan's um, founders promoted this notion of a two-nation theory. And the two-nation theory held that um, Muslims and Hindus are separate but equal nations. Now, many Pakistanis will learn in their schools that the two-nation theory meant that there had to be a separate independent state for Muslims. I mean, unfortunately, like many things that Pakistanis learn in their schools, that's what's called a fiction or, or less generously a lie. <laughs> um, in fact, Jinnah had put forward this idea in hopes that he could secure equal um, seats in a federal parliament of a united India for, India, for, for India's Muslims and Hindus. And the Indian National Congress, which became the party that, began, that, that led India, said, you've got to be crazy. Um, you're a fraction of our population. Why should you get the equivalent number of seats in a parliament? Right. And when they could not come to some concession about what a constitutional dispensation would look like for United India, and fearing that the British would back away from their decision to decolonize, basically the Indian National Congress said, fine, go have your Pakistan. And so go. the two-nation theory Can't then agree. became the justification for this independent state. And I'm happy to talk more about that for those of you that know a little bit about the two-nation theory. Kashmir was the only Muslim dominant geography in South Asia. So Pakistan felt that because it was the home of South Asia's Muslims, that it had some right uh, to Kashmir. Uh, the K, for example, in Pakistan stood for Kashmir. Oh, I didn't know that. But they didn't have a legal standing for Kashmir. It turns out there were three princely states. Um, they uh, were allowed to decide whether they would go with India or Pakistan. And Kashmir was one of those states, and its sovereign did not want to join either India or Pakistan. He was holding out for independence. So as it became apparent that Pakistan would not get Kashmir, Pakistan began its first use of non-state actors by mobilizing tribal lushkars. Um, when I talk to American audiences, we call that a posse. <laughs> I don't know what Europeans call a lushkar. Um, any, good, any good translation for a posse to a European audience? Hordes? <laughs> maybe, maybe hordes, I'm not sure. Um, basically, well, we'll use the word that they initially used was marauders. So um, contrary to Pakistan's preferred story that these were non-state actors, they were not non-state actors. They enjoyed tremendous support from the provincial governments of what was then the Northwest Frontier Province, as well as the Punjab province. The military gave them fuel and vehicles. And eventually, of course, the state itself began supplying these marauders. 
as the marauders um, converged um, near Srinagar, and they probably would have gotten to Srinagar had they not been more interested in raping and pillaging, uh, the sovereign of Kashmir asked India for help. Notably, that he had signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan. So Pakistan is in violation of the standstill agreement. Wow. He asked India for military help. India says, we'll do that on the agreement that you accede to India. So he signs the accession instrument. And as the accession instrument is being ferried to Delhi, India airlifts troops. So essentially what India is doing is airlifting troops now to defend its sovereign territory. It's part of Once India. this happens, Pakistan's yeah. army officially becomes involved. I, I want to point out that in the beginning, a low-level, not low-level, a mid-level munitions officer is actually the pioneer of this fiasco. He, he, he starts out as a major. By the time it's done, you know, he's basically a chief emperor field marshal. I mean, the ability with which he could uh, inflate his titles was quite <laughs> remarkable, given the duffer that he was. Um, nonetheless, this becomes the first India-Pakistan conflict. When this conflict ends, about one-third of Kashmir is under Pakistani control and two-thirds is under Indian control. So this first four-way, you could say, was successful, right? Had they not launched these marauders, Pakistan would have no part of Kashmir. The second time, they, they basically do a similar strategy. Um, they use non-site actors in 1965, and they're fortified with regular uh, and irregular military and paramilitary troops. And this emerges, or this morphs into the second Indo-Pakistan War of 1965. What we now know is that had India had better civil military coordination, and they um, had the army chief not erroneously reported that they were out of ammunition when they weren't, uh, India could have prosecuted that war, taken Delhi, and delivered a decisive defeat, defeat to Pakistan. Generally, this is considered to be a stalemate. But since mm -hmm. Pakistan started the war, and since Pakistan achieved none of its objectives, it's kind of a, it's a puzzle. Pakistan does this again in 1999, right? Um, this time it's actually using paramilitary disguised as Mujahideen. But it's basically, you know, the same strategy. Send a people in, we're lying about their identities, try to affect a territorial, a territorial status quo, but in this case they're, they're, they're defeated. The, the troops are actually repelled. Pakistan is at this point an international pariah. In addition, to these three wars over Kashmir, Pakistan was also decisively defeated in 1971 when a civil war, when India intervened in a civil war and uh, essentially broke up Pakistan. Pakistan in 1947 had a west wing and it had an east wing. So after this war, Pakistan had lost half of its population and half of its territory. So by any definition, this was clearly a defeat. In addition to this, Pakistan has waged a proxy war. Now we can talk about what a proxy war is and at what point um, just simply engaging in nuisance, value, sabotage, and terrorism campaign, which Pakistan did since 1947, at what point do we call this a proxy war? But Pakistan had been doing that since 1947. The nature of it changes substantively in 1990 when Pakistan takes these battle-hardened mujahideen, for, for lack of a better word, and sends them to Kashmir. All right, so we have this interesting question. Pakistan keeps banging its head against this wall over subsequent decades. It, it's got multiple, you know, goose eggs. Not really. <laughs> and it's not achieving its objectives. Worse, in doing so, Pakistan is, in fact, imperiling the very viability of the state. Why do I... So she really has a lot of good information. She definitely kind of clarifies a little bit um, how Kashmir became part of India a long time back and, and then Pakistan's repeated attempts to try to get pieces of it or part of it or all of it back. You know, they sending in their goons to, you know, start the war and then they they send in the real army later when they feel like they might win. So, you know, she really um, gives us a lot of information about how things started, how it's been going on the last, you know, 60 years or so, right? Yeah. Um, so um, this kind of reminds me of, like, the cargo war, how, like, the Pakistanis, like, fought Indians and then they asked for help. Like, they sent people there and then they asked for help. Right, when they were in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. 
and like took over the post and then started fighting the military when they came back. Yeah. Yeah, and in Pakistan, so they knew nothing about them. But then they sent in the real army, and then they wanted the U.S. to help them, and the U.S. said, mm, pull back. So, yeah, this is kind of seems to be their tactic, and they think, like, sending in these people, like, secret, secretively, it sounds like, the way she kind of put it, like, yeah. um, without, like, they don't know who they are. Pakistan doesn't know who they are, and, um, you know, and then they try to make it a war later, and... I don't know if this is their tactic, like, let's see if we can uh, win it. And it worked once. Maybe it will work again. We They got part of Kashmir, but it's definitely not. Um, it hasn't been working. So, And, you know, we listened to, you know, the UN speech about China and, and Pakistan and how they're not, they're being inhumane for people of different faiths and how they need to work on the stuff in their own country. And that's really what needs to happen first. Like stop trying to take Kashmir, work on making jobs and better economy and the good things for your own people and making a safe sanctuary for people of different faiths. Um, you know, so like India, welcoming everybody with open arms, you know, diversity yeah. is, is you know what makes india so great so you know that's kind of our message we want peace obviously always to be the answer and modi had a great quote you know he said we were once a nation pakistan and india were once a nation together and they can they should be able to peacefully and bilaterally resolve this issue with jammu and kashmir so i hope it doesn't become violent i hope it does become a peaceful talk with some agreements doesn't have to be perfect. I don't think it's going to be perfect. I know, you know, everybody probably wants Kashmir back to where it was before, but we know China has some and Pakistan has some and, and India has, you know, a part. And so come to a, a, an agreement together. Hopefully that's what we want. A peaceful agreement together. Yeah. So she really had some great information and she has lots of other videos. If you guys like this, her video, I would definitely check her out some more. She um, gives a lot of facts. I feel like, I feel like she's a fact finding, yeah. you know, she doesn't go and, um, you know, just talk out the air. She definitely has her facts behind her. So she definitely seems like a great person to, to check up on so if you like this video don't forget to click that like button down below because the more you like the more youtube shares our videos yep and don't forget to subscribe and join our wonderful family and we'll see you tomorrow bye, bye.